agenda, um, which is kind of a, a general outline of the, the things that we're going to be covering today. So if you're one of those folks who do like to follow along, feel free to go ahead and bring that uh, PDF document up and take a look at it. Um, I will also tell you that I might, might move around from time to time. Um, but we'll try to stay as close to possible with that. But we do go ahead and make sure that we cover everything that is on that agenda. Um, it's just a great resource for you to have if you really want to dig into those bugs a little bit more too. Okay, just got about a minute to get started. Um, go ahead and grab your last refill if you have time to run and grab that. And we'll get started right at the top of the hour. We've got quite a few folks coming in for today's webinar on 1811 technical services upgrades. Okay, I see that we're at the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Donna, and I'm one of the educators with Bywater Solutions. Happy to have you here with us today for the 1811 Upgrade Webinar on Tech Services. It's the first one. We will be repeating this one. Um, I have the lovely and pretty Kelly with me today, who will be helping wrangle questions and all of those sorts of things. So sweet, Donna. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> And actually, I just lost a bet with Kelly, so the next time I see her, I have to buy her Doritos and Skittles. So, but the Skittles, <laughs> the Skittles, no greens and purples. So, <laughs> so excellent. Um, and as I said before, I did post the agenda into the chat box, um, and that is going to give you um, just kind of an outline of what we're going to be covering today. So get ready for the, the, the two minute spiel on all the things that we repeat at the beginning of every webinar. Upgrades to 1811 will begin in June, and they'll continue throughout the month. Um, all upgrades will start after you have closed and uh, will populate your staff client with the typical reminder notice in that red outline about a week prior to your actual upgrade. And then remember, the only thing you have to do the morning after the upgrade is clear your cache if your um, computers are not set up to do that directly. Let me go ahead and paste that agenda in there again, Joe. There you go. Oh, <laughs> you have it in stereo now. <laughs> so. Okay, the other site that you do want to be aware of is our Bywater um, upgrade site. Um, Kelly, can I impose on you to pass, put that into our chat also? That's where you're going to find all of the information about our upgrade notes, um, all of the information about um, the webinars, all, anything that's upcoming, because we have a few more that are going to be coming also. Um, and then just, you know, all of the questions that we get during the webinars, what we do is we go ahead and put those into an FAQ and post that there also. So we do get quest different questions at the different sessions, so we make sure that everyone has access to all of that information there. So make sure you go ahead and take a look at those. And if you have colleagues who didn't have the opportunity to watch one of the webinars, or if you just really love us so much that you want to watch it again, those recordings will be up there also, and you can go ahead and take a look at all of those. So let's jump right into acquisitions. So there's been quite a few changes in acquisitions. Nothing that's significant workflow impacts, a few things that are gonna make your workflow a little bit easier, and then just some things that make things look a little bit prettier, um, a little bit easier to kind of see all of that information. So hopefully y'all will be excited about these. So one of the first ones is that there has been some reformatting of the basket information on the acquisitions page. So if I go ahead and pull up one of my baskets, you'll see here that there's a little bit different look to it. Okay, so you've got all of your information right here. Um, 
it's just a really nice neat little compact way to see all of that information you can add things like if you had basket groups all of that sort of stuff if the basket had been closed you would have that close date included in there your estimated delivery date all of that information is now just in a neat little uh, neat little spot to be able to go ahead and see that one of the other neat features that um, we're thrilled every time Koha develops a little bit more in this is under administration with your configure columns. So acquisitions now has a few more things in here that you can go ahead and adjust as far as what you want to see and what you don't want to see on that orders page. So right now, we can see that there are three columns that are hidden. Um, and perhaps this GST really drives me nuts. I don't understand why it's there. I don't want to see that on my orders anymore. I can go ahead and select that and it will go ahead and hide that. So let's go ahead and do a before and after. So you can see right now, here's the before and we have the GST and that sort of stuff showing. When I come into administration and go ahead and click to hide those, I'm going to save that column configuration. I'm going to go ahead and refresh my page. And you can see that that GST is now hidden. Um, so it does give you some flexibility now as far as what information you want to show on your orders. Um, and you can get it a little bit smaller if you don't want the, all of that information on there. Like for instance, if you don't want, um, you know, the, the replacement price to necessarily show there or something like that, you can go ahead and hide that and it doesn't really change any of the data, it just hides what shows in there. And that's the same thing with all of those configure columns is it doesn't actually delete any of the data, it just doesn't show it when you're looking at those. So again, just making it a little bit nicer, a little bit cleaner to be able to look at those sorts of things. Now this next one is really kind of exciting. It's you have the ability to duplicate an existing order lines to a specific basket. So what this does is it lets you go ahead and add a duplicate order from an existing order line. So this will help really with um, serials acquisitions or other sorts of things where you're ordering the same thing multiple times. I immediately went to like best sellers, um, you know, because you're, you need to order multiple best sellers sometimes with the public libraries. Um, it seems to work best with the, the more direct acquisitions pro um, processes, meaning Specifically, those of y'all that use EDI or um, anything like that, this may not necessarily work for you. This is really more kind of the direct ones. So what, I, what I'm going to do is I am in actually an open basket right now. So this is my basket made best sellers. What I'm going to go ahead and do is click add to basket. And then I'm going to go ahead and choose from existing orders copy. Then I'm going to go ahead and search for the book that I am looking for. Um, let's see here. Okay, and so I can go ahead and see that this item is in a different basket on order. What I can go ahead, what I'm going to go ahead and do is click this little check mark. So again, this can be really handy, again, particularly thinking with bestsellers, um, DVDs, those sorts of things. If you have multiples, um, you would be able to go ahead and grab multiples at the same time. So if you had just done, I don't know, if James Patterson pulls his usual stick and comes out with like four different books at the same time, you'd be able to search by Patterson, find all of those that were already on order and go ahead and just duplicate those in. Okay, so I've chosen that checkbox to go ahead and highlight it. I'm gonna click on next. Goes ahead and asks me to fill in the accounting information. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose my fund. So you can see it'll go ahead and use the original fund if I want to, or I can go ahead and change it. So we're a very basic library in our test site, so we only have two, the adult book and the youth department. But if you had more, you'd be able to assign it to a different fund. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that checkbox and just go ahead and use that same original fund. I don't need to change anything else. I'm gonna go ahead and click on duplicate orders. Okay, and it goes ahead gives me that button right there to go ahead and take me back to that basket that I was working on. So again, a really nice workflow to be able to kind of go and get that information and come back to where you are. And so now I can see in this open basket for May bestsellers that that one has been added in there. Okay. Um, so again, just a neat way to be able to go ahead and pull more copies of things that are that maybe are on order. Um, this could also be helpful if you're ordering from multiple locations and each location has their own baskets. Um, you can go ahead and duplicate what's being ordered from one to another. So some neat features, hopefully it's going to make it a little bit easier for y'all when you're managing um, multiple orders. 
So the next one that we are excited about is again, just help save you a couple of clicks. I can add to a basket from a file. So again, click on add to basket and it will see there's a new option now from a new file. What this is gonna do is go ahead and take me into that stage mark import tool. So I don't have to stage that file first, then go into acquisitions. I can actually start in acquisitions, go ahead and choose my file. Go through that typical process. The stage for import. And now I have this different button that is add staged files to the basket. So I can just go ahead and plop all of those right into my basket. Um, so again, it just helps move me through a little bit easier um, as far as being able to do that. Um, yes, the files do need to be MRC files coming in. Okay. So there we go. And these, again, just one way that's gonna go ahead and help uh, you know, make that process a little bit easier. Another one that has driven us all crazy um, is the ability to go ahead and separate the replacement cost and the retail price fields and acquisitions. So basically what this patch does is it gives us the ability to, re to remove some of this confusion about what the replacement price RRP field. Um, really what was happening is the retail price was being used, but, the, but it was set for different ones at different points. and just really was very confusing and difficult to go ahead and set those. So what we're doing now is I'm going to go ahead and add something else to my basket. We're going to go ahead and do, um, we'll do something from the existing record. Go ahead and look for ponies. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and order this one. Okay. And so now you can see here that I can go ahead and put in my vendor price and say my vendor price is $12 and 53 cents, 52 cents. And then the retail price is actually going to be $19 and 99 cents. And then the replacement cost is going to be $25. Okay. So again, really neat function that it will go ahead and split all of those up. And it does go ahead and include that correct budgeted cost in there also. Um, so again, it basically just lets you set all of those fields independently. Um, the retail price is used to, de or excuse me, the vendor price is used to determine the cost when ordering and the replacement price will go ahead and carry over when you actually receive those items. So again, it it's just helps make that a little bit clearer when you're going through and setting all of those up. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that item. Oh, I always forget to say where that money is coming from. There we go. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and close this basket now. And then I'm gonna go ahead and receive those items and show you the, the, how it carries all the way over. Okay, so I'm gonna receive shipments. There is my understanding horses and ponies. I go ahead and receive that item. Again, you can see here that it does go ahead and distinguish the prices, the replacement price um, and the retail price there. Okay. And then I do have the ability to go ahead and edit any of those at this point also. Um, so again, just a nice way to be able to go ahead and see that in there when I go ahead and receive that. We have a question, Donna, but we'll, we'll, 
wait for this moment to arrive when you. <laughs> okay, so that has now been received and is gone. Um, let me go ahead and search. We're going to do it here. I'm going to go ahead and search the OPAC for that one. Ponies. Let's see. That's not one of them because I didn't do it. So I have managed to lose the record. I told y'all that I would do something bizarre with that. However, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> this is why they don't let me catalog. <laughs> go back one screen. Go back one screen. Just go back one. Go down to go. Okay, save. That's saved, right? Yeah, it's saved. You'll see it one more time. So. Go scroll down to the bottom. Keep going. Oh, all the way down. I didn't go far enough. See, I'm just not patient enough. And then hit finish receiving first, though. There were a lot of items in that basket. Okay, now scroll down. There okay. we go. Now you can go click right into understanding horses and ponies. So we can see that it's is carrying that data over. And Must be that top one, Don. Yeah, so. Go to edit. Oops, not batch. Yeah, items, there we go. Nope scroll. nope, scroll to the top. Go way over. There it is, 1252. Oh, do we have barcodes turned on? I don't know. Why? Because I didn't enter a barcode and I was looking for one without a barcode. Oh, okay. We must. Okay. So that was, we did have a question. What if you use the replacement price feature in the item types table? Will this impact or override that? So really good question. The way Koha works is when you go to charge someone for that item, it looks to the 952V, which is your replacement cost. If there is something in that field, it will use that data. So it would basically override um, that, whatever you have as your default. If, you're too, if your 952V is empty, then it will go ahead and use whatever you have set at the item type level. Perfect. All right, so then we can see that we have our normal purchase price as 1252 and we have our replacement price as $25, so, okay. Now, Andrew, who is so amazing, created a report also. So we can go ahead and see how these different prices show into our reports here. Um, so you can go ahead and see, let me go to the, he probably did these in order. Let me go to the end. Okay. And so here you can see the acorders.e cost, the acorders.replacement price, the items.price, and the items.replacement price. So you can see those different values in there as far as how they go ahead and populate through. Um, so you can see where all of those different fields show up in your reports. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and hop back to my basket. Okay, so the next thing is kind of just, again, just a little, a little enhancement. Yeah, Andrew's amazing when it comes to writing reports. He's just absolutely fantastic with it. We can post that in the Q&A as well. Oh, that would be great, yeah. Um, okay, so when I'm in a basket, again, go ahead and put that. Now we open it. Okay, I'm gonna come down to this understanding horses and ponies again. So this is something that we've already received. 
So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go ahead and click the link for um, adding an internal note. And I can go ahead and it just goes ahead and brings a pop up. Um, it used to actually take you to a completely separate page. Um, and obviously, as you can see from me, I, for those of us that struggle moving around because we keep losing our screens or don't scroll down all the way, this just makes it a little bit easier to go ahead and, and add that right there. It doesn't take you to a new page, it just brings you to a pop up. So again, right there in front of you, um, a quick way to be able to go ahead and add either the internal or the vendor notes. Okay. Um, something else that's kind of neat here is you can now see who created that order line. Um, so this is, um, it's a new field, acorders.created underscore by, um, and is visible in the receiving process. Um, so this can come in handy too if you've got multiple, um, you know, multiple people that are ordering and you just wanna make see, you know, additional information. Basically what's gonna happen is when you're looking at your baskets, there's um, additional, information there. So we're going to go ahead and look at, well, let's look at Kelly's fault. I, I really like to name my baskets unique names. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and actually go back to receive something. So um, let me go ahead and receive a shipment. And you can see now I have this more. And if I click on order, before this used to be called just view record and you could only see the mark and the card. Now if you see you've got that order there, I'm gonna go ahead and click on order. And what that does is it goes ahead and pops up and gives me a little bit of information that this was created on 9-5-2018, ordered by Ms. Kelly M um, with her information there. Um, and any sort of claim date. So this also will show in the receiving screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and receive this. Okay. And again, you can see who ordered that one. So who actually put that order into that basket. It does not actually show in the basket itself, um, but it does show kind of after the fact when you're looking at things um, to be able to see those sorts of things. So it does show you who that was ordered by. Now the next one, which I know Kelly absolutely loves, is the ability to add adjustments to an invoice. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into my invoices. So perhaps I ordered something and, um, you know, like with Amazon, it's the, here, buy it now at this price, and if it goes down, we'll credit you with the difference and just charge you for that additional, for that, you know, whatever it is. Um, same sort of thing as, you know, for instance, if you get a credit for returned books and you want to go ahead and reflect that in your information, um, or on the other side, if they charge you extra because of, um, instead of, you know, clear coding a book, they had to do something else with it, rebind it, whatever. Um, you can go ahead and make those adjustments to that invoice, which is really helpful. Um, so what I can go ahead and do here is I'm going to go ahead and look at that invoice. Okay. I have a new box down here called adjustments and I can go ahead and click on add an adjustment. Okay. I do have some options here as far as the amount. Now, if it's a refund, I'm gonna to wanna to use a negative number because I don't wanna charge myself again for something. So I'm gonna say that I'm getting a refund of $1.67. Um, and the reason for that, drop down menu, which means it's an authorized value, which means you can control what's in here. So you can set up the, this in your authorized value as far as what, that, what those reasons might be if you're gonna be using these adjustments. So I'm gonna say it's a vendor discount, okay? Um, and I can add a note saying, you know, price drop before publication, something like that. I can indicate what fund it needs to go to. So this is gonna to go to the adult book fund. And then I can also encumber that while the invoice is still open. So it doesn't have to be a closed invoice. It can be one that's still open, depending on your workflow, if I want to go ahead and include that. I'm going to go ahead and update the adjustment. Okay. And then as I take a look, 
you will see in your summary any sort of adjustments that are there. So it'll be included in that, in that dollar amount there. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and add another one. And this one is going to be the amount of, they're charging me $11.95 because this one is going to be for processing, something like that. Um, you know, um, item has to be rebound. Whatever, again, make it up, if whatever works for y'all. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and add that to the adult book fund also, and just update my adjustments there. And so you'll be able to see all of those in your adjustments, okay? You can edit those, you can delete them if you want to, but it does go ahead and show all of that information here. So again, just a neat little feature um, to be able to go ahead and see those adjustments and much, much easier than some of the shenanigans we used to have to do before, which was reopening things, changing the invoices, deleting record. I mean, it was just, sometimes it would get really complicated. Um, perfect example. So Laurel says they make adjustments to tax often. Um, and that's a perfect example for that one. So one of your authorized values you're gonna wanna have is gonna be for tax. Um, and that's gonna be a great way to be able to go ahead and, and make those changes. So, perfect. All right. Yeah, Laurel, so that's another thing. Um, she, she comments that vendors and COHA don't always calculate the same. I can tell you that there has been a lot of work going on um, with calculating, and so that should be a lot closer now. Um, but still, the way taxes are often calculated, it's not, yeah, <laughs> almost like, yeah, we know. <laughs> um, because the tax is not calculated necessarily on a direct percentage, um, but more like ranges, it can be a little bit odd sometimes. Um, so yeah, hopefully um, we're gonna keep making those a little bit better. And then all of this rounding sorts of things. Um, we got into quite a discussion about how many um, decimal places things should be rounded out to, and that can cause an issue with that. Um, which of course got me on a train of thought of, wasn't there a great movie where they were taking like the, the tiny little percentages of the pennies left over and wound up with tons and tons of money or something? I have this vague recollection of a movie. I should ask a librarian which one that was. Anyways, okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at our next um, feature. And this is internal and vendor notes for received orders. Um, so again, this is kind of a neat function that on this invoice, you can go ahead and see that um, these items have actually been received and I can go ahead and change notes for them at this point. Um, so again, a neat little function that I can add those later. So if I go back to my basket that I had, oh, office space, yep. okay. <laughs> See, that's why I love talking to librarians because we know everything and if we don't know it, someone else knows it, it's awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my basket here. So this one is closed. I'm gonna go ahead and click on view here. Okay, and I've gone ahead and received this one already, the Understanding Horses, but again, I can come in here and add this internal note after received. Um, so you can do that on both the internal notes and the vendor notes, and it will go ahead and show. You didn't used to be able to do that, so again, this is a neat way um, that if you need to add a note after you've already received something, you don't have to unreceive it and then receive it again. Um, you can go ahead and just have those in there. So again, just a neat little, Neat little function um, to be able to go ahead and do that. Okay, now this next one, we're popping over to cereals for a little bit. Um, for those of y'all that work with cereals, you're gonna absolutely love this, maybe, I don't know. Um, but what you can do is you can have several open orders on a subscription. Um, so you used, to, you used to not be able to enter a second order for subscription if you still had an order on it, um, an order open, now you can. Um, so it just gives you a little bit, again, flexibility as far as being able to, um, you know, manage your cereals a little bit more. And that goes along with this next one, um, which is allowing several, several receipts for a given subscription. So in this case, you can go ahead and set a quantity um, as far as how you're going to get the, as how many you're going to get. So we are going to go ahead and we'll keep using this May bestsellers one. I'm going to reopen it again. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and add to the basket and I'm going to add from a subscription. And we 
we're going to search for Bon Appetit. Okay, and I am going to go ahead and place the order. And so right now, I can say, you know what, I actually want to receive five of these. Um, so this is a good example of things um, like I know an academic sometimes um, it's a serial in theory, but each um, serial or each issue is charged individually, um, depending on the topic, and you may want multiples of certain ones or individuals of certain ones, things like that. Um, and so with that serial now, you can have five copies of this particular issue and one copy of another issue and things like that. So it just gives you a little bit more flexibility as far as being able to go ahead and set uh, multiple quantities instead of, again, trying to manipulate things around, stuff like that. Um, and then so I'm going to go ahead and update these so we can see that there is a change. So we're going to say this is a great magazine and just in parentheses internal. And then we'll leave the vendor note alone as it is. Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and save that. See, did it again. I always just assume that the books get bought. It doesn't matter where the money comes from. Unlimited supplies of money, Donna, in your dreams. Yes. That's how I always bought materials. <laughs> so. That's how I buy books, <laughs> personally. <laughs> I, and that's the thing is that Amazon has just got us so used to just click and it's yours. Um, so I think that I can do that in Koha too. Y'all probably shouldn't let me near actual money at any point. So, okay. <laughs> so um, what's kind of neat now is that you can go ahead and see, um, again, we do have our notes here. I'm going to go ahead and look at the record. Okay. And in the subscriptions section, um, there we go. In the acquisitions section of your subscription, you can go ahead and see the information and how many quantity are being received, the subscription number, um, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and then again, you do have that information um, about that issue and things like that that you're looking at. So it goes ahead and it displays the acquisition details. Um, it shows your notes on there um, as you're looking through things. So again, just giving you more options as far as being able to see um, all of that information. So back to information. And I want to go ahead and Okay, I'm um, going back into that one again. I jumped ahead of myself. Okay. So when I am looking at acquisitions detail, there we go. Okay. It also includes your subscription call number in here. So if we had call numbers on there, you'd be able to see that details there, um, which ours are blank, so we don't have that in there. But if you properly cataloged your materials, you would be able to see your subscription call numbers um, for there. And again, since we have multiple holdings on that, we would be able to have multiple call numbers depending on what we need to do that. But that acquisitions details tab um, does provide more than just um, as far as what we're talking about with quantities and the status and all of those sorts of things. Okay. There is, of course, 
um, a whole lot of work that was done in permissions. And now permissions is set to um, a new, there's a new permission for being able to manage suggestions. This was, a, this was one that we had a lot of questions about as far as being able to set that, set those changes. Go ahead and grab a patron real quick. Oh, Kelly, you're an adult, not a staff member. Let me see if I can still find this permission in here. Um, so again, with the permissions, um, there was, you know, permission for managing, there was not one specifically for managing suggestions. So this was introduced um, when someone discovered that if you had the exact URL link, you could act, access the purchase suggestion module. Um, so let me go ahead and, oops. Actually, I'm seeing, let me pull up someone who's not Kelly who's not an adult. Okay, so now you can see here that under acquisitions, there is the suggestions underscore manage, and this gives him the ability to go ahead and manage purchase suggestions. But he doesn't have the ability to go ahead and do any of these other things. Um, so again, it's nice to be able to go ahead and have that as part of it, because before you had to give access to like some manage, manage budgets and things like that. This one is specifically suggestions underscore manage, manage purchase suggestions, and that's all he would be able to do. So if I go ahead and come in here and sign out, and then I'll sign in as him, He does have that suggestions pending approval that will show for him when he comes in here. But that would be the only thing that he'll be able to do is go ahead and manage those suggestions in there. So again, a neat feature to be able to go ahead and kind of specify um, who can work with, with suggestions without having to um, do anything else with that um, acquisitions module or budgets. There is another one that um, has been separated out. This one I'm not quite sure about, but apparently it was needed. There is one that is specifically for currencies and exchange rates. So um, you could also give someone the ability only to manage the currencies and exchange rates um, if that's something that's helpful for y'all. That is a permission that has been broken out there. Okay. Let me go back to my... I don't want Howard anymore. I'm gonna go back to my acquisitions. And again, this next one is just a little bit of, um, you know, kind of a, a neat way to be able to go ahead and um, make things a little bit smoother. So we are going into acquisitions. We are going into Fund. No, that's not right. Sorry, wrong, wrong button. Oh, I'm still logged in as Howard. That's why. Which I'm sure all of y'all out there were saying, well, if you logged into the right person, you probably saw that before I did. I, I wasn't saying that, Donna, at all. I <laughs> oh, you most definitely were, Kelly. I could feel it. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Acquisitions. Funds. So that's a perfect example, though, of when you have limited access, like Howard does, um, that you won't be able to see those sorts of things. Um, so under funds, I do have the ability to go ahead and edit a fund. Okay. I am going to select an owner or add a, add a user. Either one will work for this one. So I'm going to go ahead and just add a user to this. And you get that pop-up now that you can go ahead and search for the patron. Um, I'm trying to think 
who all we might have in here. You can see that it does tell you that only staff with super librarian or acquisitions permissions or order underscore managed permissions um, will, will come back. So you won't be able to add this to someone who doesn't have that um, permission set up. So you don't have to worry about that. So I can go ahead and click and say, yep, that's the patron that I want to add, or that's the staff member that I want to add to this. Um, and so then it goes ahead and adds that patron. I can close that window and it's right there for me. So again, just a little bit easier um, to be able to go ahead and add that one in there. So. Okay, I know you all knew that there was going to be system preferences coming and here they are. We can't have an upgrade without adding multiple system preferences. So this next one um, took me a little while to get used to, but I guess I kind of like it now. Um, this new system preference is called additional fields in Z3950 result search. Not quite the longest one, but it's close. Um, so what this is going to do is it's under cataloging and importing. Um, you can go ahead and say what additional mark fields or subfields you want to show up in your Z3950 search. And it adds a new column for that one. So for instance, we are showing the 037B, the 245H, the 336. Um, do we need spaces with those? What can we do? And then perhaps I also want to show, I don't know, the 338 and the 550A. Making numbers up so catalogers don't panic. Um, I'm going to go ahead and save those cataloging preferences. Okay, so now when I go ahead and do a cataloging search using my Z3950, it's going to go ahead and give me um, more columns in my Z3950 results. So I'm going into cataloging. I'm going to do a new Z3950. I'm going to go ahead and search for the Drake. Okay, and so now you can see if there's any content in those fields that I asked for, it's going to go ahead and show. Um, so these that didn't have a 245 age and it didn't have the 550, whatever I pulled in there, things like that. Um, but it did have the 336 and the 338. So again, a nice feature. If there's a particular, oh, you can't see my pop up. Oh, that's terrible. Hold on. Let me see. on that one instead. I am so sorry. So there's a couple things that y'all missed. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know, Sarah. Um, okay, so you can see now in that um, Z3950 results that we go ahead and have those additional fields columns. So if there is something that y'all look for, um, particularly like I know some libraries will say, well, we always check this field um, in the Z3950 result, results, you can go ahead and have that show immediately so you don't have to actually go into that record and see it. Um, so again, kind of a neat feature to be able to go ahead and do that sort of thing. So um, definitely take advantage of that one. And again, that is the, um, the system preference additional fields in Z3950 result search. Okay. I feel we should have some ominous music playing at this point because we're going into Rancor. So we're heading over to the advanced. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, I always feel like there should be like an automatic sound coming through for this. I, I could make that happen for you, Donna. Good. I think you should. <laughs> the Buffy theme song. <laughs> there we go. So this one is called Add Auto Control Number Widget. Basically what it does is it lets you um, add an automatically incrementing local control number in the 001. I will pause while you think that through and have the celebratory dances going on everywhere, I'm sure. Um, but really, this, this does come in handy. And I, we have had libraries ask for this, obviously, so that's why it was developed. Um, but really what it does is you can go ahead and set your control numbers. Um, you would set that through your authorized value, control num sequence, okay? Um, and then you can go ahead and say how you want those to show up. I'm gonna go ahead and grab um, the authorized value right now to show you how you would set that up. Um, but this definitely would be something that's gonna be helpful for, for some libraries. 
So we're going to administration for our authorized values. We go ahead and click on authorized values. And then again, it is control underscore num underscore sequence. Okay, and then you can go ahead and see the authorized value that we've established, any sort of description in there, things like that. Um, the authorized value should end in a number, um, which kind of makes sense because you don't want something ending in a letter. You want it to end in a number. Otherwise, it's not going to go ahead and increase the way that it needs to. Um, and it can also have numbers at the start. And this is this, whatever you put in that authorized value is what's going to be entered in the 001. And it's going to go ahead and keep incrementing that as you go. Um, the description is what's going to show um, in the label when you're in the editor. Um, not particularly important unless you are one of those libraries that maybe has four or five different control number schemes that you're managing. And if you are, I am so sorry. Um, but there you go. It is in there. You can have multiple ones of these also. Okay, so I'm going to go back into my here. We are creating a new record. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and create an 001 field. I did something really bad with the editor the other day because I was testing something. So maybe create like a new one and see if new new one. Like you don't even have leaders in there, but that's because. All right, let me let me get completely out then. See, and Kelly just knows anytime I try to catalog things, it just does not go well. I know, I was kind of getting worried for you and I was like, it's not starting off well because I didn't put you in a good place. <laughs> if I'm, oh, I, I don't know what happened. Oh, yeah, I don't know why. Show helpers. See, there. I knew. <laughs> Took me a minute, but I knew what it was. I thought it was what I did the other day too, and I was like, oh no. All right, so when I add 001, <laughs> we'll get this together. Are we building y'all's confidence when you ask us cataloging yeah, questions? Sarah's like, phew, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I kind of broke it. <laughs> Kelly's our cataloging expert, thank goodness. <laughs> so, um, okay, so when I add that 001, it goes ahead and says that I can. <laughs> You're awful sweet, Sarah. We're used to it. We make fools of ourselves on a regular basis, so it doesn't bother us in the slightest. Um, what you can do, though, is you can go ahead and come in here. You can go ahead and override it if you want to add a manual number. Um, so if, for instance, there's something unusual that you need to be able to do, you can go ahead and do that. You do have the ability to choose your multiple numbering selections. Um, so if you do have multiple schemes, um, we'll be able to go ahead and do that. And then you also can go ahead and just have it assign the next. So what it's going to do is it's gonna go ahead and just automatically update that number to the next one that is in your system. So you can see it's going up to 003, 004, 005, things like that. Um, so you can go ahead and do that. It's gonna go ahead and save that into that record. Okay. So again, that's your 001 that you can go ahead and do those um, with that system preference that you can go ahead and have the control num sequence um, that will go ahead and add that automatic control number in your 001. So you don't have to keep track of it. I know that I've talked to libraries that do actually keep track of that manually. And so this is going to be a nice feature for them to be able to go ahead and just do that um, this way instead. So as much as I make fun of it, it's a neat feature. Um, Rancor just I don't, I don't have enough of a memory to be able to remember what everything needs to go in there. So got a fancy new widget for the 001s, what that all comes down to. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and change. Did, Donna, didn't um, Andrew submit a bug saying if this could happen for the 001, wouldn't it be great if we could do this for barcodes where you could add your own number? Yes. Say this is where I wanna start. Yep, that would, that would really be a neat way to be able to do it. I mean, we do have the ability to do that automatic barcode increase, but, um, you know. If we ordered the wrong set of barcodes. Exactly, 
Exactly. Yeah. Um, so then that what's really exciting with a lot of this sort of stuff is that we'll and it drives our developers nuts when we do this because, you know, they'll be like, look at this really cool thing we developed and we'll go, oh, that's really neat. And it'd be really cool if you could do this, too. Um, so it kind of pops their balloon. But it is that's one thing that we really do like is that, you know, things are being built that will continue to be built on. Um, and that's where we really need y'all too is to be able to say, hey, you know what, this is really cool. Let's do this also, um, you know, the, the and functions. So it's going to be a neat way to be able to go ahead and kind of set those sorts of things up. So, okay, another system preference here. Um, this one is called, these are all going to be Mark Field. I can just do Mark Field 4, if that'll go ahead and bring these up. Um, we touched on this briefly in um, the overview webinars, but with these, you do have the ability to go ahead and set this new system preference. You can identify what field and subfield you would like these to be um, kept in. And this will go ahead and, and record either or and whatever combination you want. The person who created the record and who updated the record last. Um, so it doesn't necessarily track every single person who has created, who has touched that record, but it will show you the last person who has made a change to that record. And it will either carry, it will either track the borrower number or the name or both. And so in this situation, we're saying that in the 945A, I want the borrower number to show and I want the creator's name to show in 945B. I want the last modifier number in 945C and the last modifier name in 945D. Again, you can choose any field you want to. I would not suggest using, like I said yesterday, the 999C, not a good choice. Probably none of your 952 fields either, um, since that is your, your item information and technically not really part of your MARC record. Um, so you really wanna have those in something else. So that's why we went with the 945s because those aren't really being used okay so when i go ahead and create a new record <laughs> yay i made heather happy that's all we hope for on one of these is that there's at least one thing that she likes so phew we got that one out of the way <laughs> okay I'm gonna go ahead and fill in my required fields. Um, there is also a function, if you want it, uh, go ahead and let us know, um, that with these little, if you're like me and you just can't see, um, you've got these little tiny red asterisks that show you what needs to be mandatory. Um, we do have some JavaScript that will go ahead and change this entire phrasing to red, so it jumps out at you a whole lot more. So if that's something that would be helpful for you, um, just go ahead and open a ticket and we can pop that in. It'll take about two minutes to do it. So, okay, and then title Donna's book. Oops. Okay, and then the 900s. I'm going to go ahead and add my item type. I'm going to save that record. And then so now when I take a look at it, you will see that in the 945, it has added that local processing information for both my user number and my name as far as who was the last person, who was the person that created it, that will stay the same. Um, and then who was the last person to edit it, that will change on a regular basis um, as far as who the last person to touch that record. Again, you can use, either use borrower number or the username or both. It's entirely up to you what you wanna be able to do. Um, so that's kind of a neat function to be able to do that um, and see that information tracked in there. You do not have to have your Biblio logs on, um, so it doesn't have to track all of your Biblio changes. This works independently of that. Um, so you don't have to have those logs turned on in order to be able to use this function. So that is your mark field for creator ID, creator name, modifier ID, and modifier name. Okay, next up, I am going to go ahead and show you a new addition to the batch item modification tool, which I'm kind of excited about. Um, I think this is a neat addition and I hopefully y'all are gonna like this one too. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this report. Okay, I'm gonna move all of these item numbers over to 
my batch modification tool. And you can see there's a new, a new column right here next to the title called holds. This is going to show you how many bib level holds and how many item level holds are on that record. So before you modify things, that's one more thing that you might want to look at is um, how many holds or how many bib level holds and how many item level holds are on that particular item. So the first number is the holds on the specific item. The second number is the number of holds on that bib. Okay. So again, you can see holds on this item, total holds on this bib. So again, a nice little feature um, that before you stop modifying things, you can go ahead and take a look and see if there's any sorts of issues. I particularly see this really, really helpful um, of when you are withdrawing materials because you typically don't want to withdraw materials that have holds on the bibs. Um, or if you do, you need to be aware that you need to go ahead and order new ones. So again, a neat little feature that just kind of goes ahead and gives you a heads up um, on what those sorts of, you know, on that, on that information with your holes information. Okay. All right. Another one of my favorites, this is where I get, you know, Heather, get your, get your smelling salts out. Mark modifications, uh, mark modification templates. I do bizarre things with these. It does make people remember how to do them though, so that, you know, it works as a training tool. So mark modification templates, we have a new function in here that we're really excited about. So in the past, there was only one option of add slash update. We now have the ability of update existing or add new and add new. So if I go ahead and add a new action in here, we do have our add new, which is what we had before, but we now have it broken out so that I can do update existing or add new. And so what we can do here is I can go ahead and say, okay, with the 945 F field, I want this to be this value added in here. And so what that's going to do is it's going to look at that 945 F field. And if there is an existing 945 F, it will go ahead and update that field to the value that I've put in here. If there is not that field already, it will go ahead and add that field and include that value. Um, so again, it just goes ahead and gives you that ability to go ahead and gives you more flexibility um, as far as having that, that option in there um, of not just, you know, adding a new field. We kind of looked at this with things like, you know, if I had a 945 field in there already for some records, but not for others, you know, how do you make that work? So that's what this is a response to is you have that update existing or add new or that straight add new field, depending on what works for your records. So again, nice little function. Um, I'm just going to call this something silly. Okay, so again, that add slash update is a nice little function to be able to go ahead and do those sorts of things. All right, while we are in tools, oh, I got two wonderful ones from Heather. I'm so happy. <laughs> I was just going to say, you're getting quite excitement over here. I do love Heather's enthusiasm for cataloging. Um, it's just, it's great because uh, honestly, you know, cataloging does not get all the love that it deserves. Um, so I am glad to see that there are people that are excited about what you can do with it. And it, there are some neat things that we can do there. Sure, we'll go with cataloging is awesome, Heather. Why not? <laughs> Um, it reminds me of the arguments we used to get into in library school about what was the most important department in the, in the library. You know, was it the cataloging? Because without the cataloging, you can't find the materials. And without the reference librarians, the, the patrons wouldn't be able to get the materials. And without the circulation staff, they would be able to check anything out. So you kind of get to that little, you know, we're all amazing people and we all do amazing jobs. And so we just kind of settle it there. <laughs> okay, another one that is really exciting um, and this is a, one of those things that we, had, we bang our heads against time and time again, um, is that we now have a new option for splitting call numbers. So you can customize how you want your call numbers split on your labels. So a neat little, neat, neat little feature. Um, so the prime example that we use with this one is with um, Library of Congress. When you've added like reference to the beginning of it, um, when you go ahead and add that REF to the beginning of it, it throws off your, your splitting rules. 
So we now have the ability to go ahead and define custom ones. So I would think any of y'all that might use custom cataloging, um, custom classification system, that sort of thing, that it doesn't split for you properly in the labels, this will be a neat way to be able to go ahead and do this one. So under administration, we go ahead and go into the classification sources, which frankly is one of those places that once you've set up your initial installation, you, you probably don't go back there again. Um, but what you can do is so now when you have a classification source, you now have the ability to go ahead and define a filing rule and the splitting rule that goes along with this one. Okay. Um, so what we've done, what Andrew has done, because he's, he knows regex and he learned how to do this, is you can go ahead and set this up. We do recommend um, perhaps opening a ticket on this one because it can be a little complicated. And if you don't know regex, it's going to take a little while to figure that out. So let us know because we can go ahead and, and get those set up for you and get you working on that. Um, so for instance, I am going to go ahead and show you what this would typically look like um, before we use this. Okay, so. So here's the call number that we would see. I'm gonna go ahead and export this. Okay. Go ahead and choose our template and our layout. Oh, and Kelly, this is the one you messed with today, isn't it? Um, no, I didn't mess with it, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one that you fixed today, so it doesn't show the it doesn't show poorly. It shows right. poorly. Right. However, we can easily change that if you just click the title, and we can change the classification scheme. Andrew, and actually, Andrew never it, went into the labels when he showed this. That's why I didn't think I was messing with your. <laughs> So this is actually a good example too, though. We did discover that you do need to make sure that your classification system is updated if you do something a little bit different. Um, so I'm going to change this back from regex to actually Library of Congress. So it'll actually be the wrong one that we're looking for. Um, so just kind of be aware of that, of, you know, this, this may take a little finessing, um, things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and do this again and show you the poor one, just in case you haven't seen these. Um, it, go, it does go ahead and do kind of some odd things sometimes with the, um, the LC classification and splitting numbers. Okay. Okay, so th that's still not showing wrong, but... Oh, no, Donna, it was. Go back to it. You went too quick. You went too quick. Let's see here. Spine and spine. Export. See how it's doing the dot? Got it, yep, okay. So this one is showing incorrectly because it's putting the dot in the wrong spot. So what we can do is when we come into, when we come in here, we can go ahead and define splitting rules using regular expressions. And so this is an example of why we say go ahead and contact us because you have to understand what this is to be able to do those sorts of things. Okay. But what you can, what is neat is I can go ahead and take that same call number and test it to see if it's going to do what I want it to do. And so this is how that label is going to print out. And you can see that that dot is now in the right, in the right place. So really what this is doing, um, as Andrew explained it to us, and it says when it look, you know, it looks for this and substitutes this um, sort of thing with what it's doing with all of that regex. So 
um, let us know. We can more than, we're more than happy to set this up. It doesn't just have to be for Library of Congress. It can be anyone if they're having challenges um, setting up the, their spine labels to print correctly because it's not splitting the right way. You do have this option to go ahead and set this information in here. Um, if we pick it, will it still sort the same way? So that's where you can go ahead and decide if you want it to do that or not, because those are all independent. Um, so you do have that filing rule also. So you can leave the filing rule as LC and you can have the, the splitting as regex. So yeah, it's really just um, kind of just a display thing. So yeah, that still will go ahead and work the same way. Um, I also look at this too, is that you could use this for you know, libraries that are relabeling their collection, um, that you know, they want to go ahead, um, why does it say sorting under classification splitting rules? That's a really good question. That yeah. may have been one that we were messing with. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, we haven't, that's, that might just be an anomaly in there, don't know. Um, but yeah, just pretend like you didn't see that, Heather, because that doesn't do anything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but like, for instance, with libraries, if you have, for instance, you know, a, log, a larger collection and some of your books um, are classified M penny and MYS penny um, and things like that, and you want them all to go ahead and have that same label, you can go ahead and set the rules up to do that sort of thing too. Um, so it can go ahead and, and do some modifications as far as your call numbers for the labels. It doesn't necessarily change the call number on your items, but it would go ahead and change those labels so your labels would all look the same. So it'll go ahead and give you some consistency when you're doing those sorts of things. So um, that's the, the splitting rules for those sorts of things. So, okay, um, one more thing and we're gonna be done. So almost there. Um, and this last one is back into serials. And when you receive your serials, you will have the ability to go ahead and set the received date to today on multiple serials. So there is a condition with this one and that is if you are not um, creating records on receiving, that is the only time that you can do those multi-receivings, okay? Um, so if you are using the multi-receiving, you can go ahead and set it not to, um, you can go ahead and set it to have those multiple receivings at once. So I'm gonna go back into my serials. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and find Title that does not that is not creating items. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and use my serial receive. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and choose multi receiving. How many issues do I want to receive? So if this is something that I get for seven different locations, I can go ahead and receive all of them at once. Um, and what it will do is I can go ahead and set that received date to today on all of them, okay? Um, so if I don't check that box, all issues will just show the expected publication date as their received date. But if I go ahead and check that box on all of those issues, it's gonna go ahead and add that particular um, date that I put in there. So again, I know a lot of folks don't use the serials. Um, and a lot of folks, you know, don't necessarily get multiple ones if you do use the serials, but that is just a little, little, uh, um, little feature to add the ability to set the received date today on multi-receiving multi serials instead of having to do those manually. So that is the big stuff that we have in here. Um, obviously, there are a whole lot more bugs um, that have been fixed, but a lot of those are really just little things um, that most folks are not going to be, you know, that you probably haven't dealt with, um, but they are out there, things like that. Um, so let us know if you have any questions. Go ahead and take a look at the, um, the complete documentation as far as all the bugs. Hopefully this has given you a couple of things that might be interesting that uh, we're gonna make your workflow a little bit easier. And of course, as always, open tickets, ask us questions, let us know how we can help. So we are over time. If you need to go, please feel free to go, but I am more than happy to stay here and answer questions for you. Um, and I know that Kelly will be more than happy to answer questions for you too. She knows more than I do about some of this. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what did you, I mean, you are more of a cataloger than either Andrew or myself. Is there anything here that would make you really happy? Um, I'm excited for the red jacks and the labels. Not that I know red jacks, but I know, I know some people, I know some people who can hook me up. 
<laughs> you have connections. Yeah. And, um, I also like the staging the file into the basket without going into tools. Yeah. I also like the having the person's um, name go into the record when it's created. I think that would be super handy for libraries. That one I do love. I know we've had a lot of libraries that have asked that question when we're doing training. Um, and so now we have a, a great answer for them. I have to say my other favorite one is um, being able to split out the retail price, the replacement cost, and the budgeted cost. Mm -hmm. um, that's one that I know that we've dealt with on a regular basis trying to get sorted out. So I'm very excited about that. Waiting to see if anybody has questions. I see a lot of folks have popped out. Oh, here we go. Uh, the name being stored in the record after editing makes me want to change my name. <laughs> yeah, go for it. I totally oh would, Heather. I totally would. Except I'd probably go with something like, like SpongeBob or Squidward <laughs> or something like that. Um, okay, so Anita wants to know, is there possibly a legend or key or something that tells us which bug updates require system preferences and which updates need turning on? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, the, there is a link to the, the Koha release notes in the um, Open 1811 upgrade note web page, and that release notes will link to all the system preferences. We could certainly add it somewhere else if it's easier, but that release notes would give you a whole list of those. Okay. Um, and then Sherry wants to know about seeing that 945 that we talked about, um, if that's gonna show on the OPAC side. That's only gonna show if you have that set up to show in your default framework. Um, and so that's why we went ahead and shoot, chose that record. Um, and I'm not sure if we have ours set to show in the 945s or not in the OPAC. So I'm gonna take a quick, quick peek to see if that's one that we have displaying in the OPAC. Um, so no, we do not have the 945 set up to show in our OPAC. Um, so that's the same example is that it's, you know, just make sure that that's not displaying um, in your default framework um, in, the, in the OPAC, so. Okay, oh, thanks for coming to another one, Christina. So. Okay, good questions. Okay, well, again, thank you all for coming. Um, we have lots more um, webinars coming up. So again, please join us and we hope that you, uh, you enjoy some of these new